are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna, but today's case is about cosmetic surgery that ended in murder by a doctor. But it's not what you think. A murder had been plotted with every scenario accounted for. Survival was not an option, even when the victim knew what was coming. This case continues to uncover horror upon horror until the very end. I also want to thank our sponsor, Switchcraft. This is a brand new game that allows you to play as Bailey, who is a freshman at a top witchcraft university, and she actually has a best friend who had vanished. So you are going through these levels looking for Bailey's best friend, and it's basically a choose your own adventure story with a thousand different levels to complete with more added all the time. My favorite part is that they have so many characters that are completely diverse. Diverse. They also have characters with disabilities, part of the LGBTQ plus community, and it really is just a very inclusive game, which is something that is so incredible and should be done all the time. But if you want to play, which I really recommend you playing, it came out this month and you can download it and play it for free using the link down below in my description. So all you have to do is click that link and you can get started playing Switchcraft. So thank you to Switchcraft for sponsoring this portion of the video. And if you don't know, it is my absolute passion to tell these stories. I mean, no harm or disrespect when I do so. So if that's something that you would like to support me in doing, all you have to do is make sure you are subscribed with the post notification bell on, given this video you a thumbs up and leave me a nice comment down below. Now let's get back to the story. So it was 2007 in Utah and the McNeil family lived in a kind of a suburb, a gated community called Pleasant Grove. Now this was Michelle and Martin who had eight children and they were biological as well as adopted. Now they had met almost 30 years prior at a church function where they were a part of an LSD community church. So they were Mormons and they had a single young adult kind of activity where they could go and meet meet people that they could possibly fall in love with and that is where they met and Michelle was this beautiful popular girl who was involved in acting cheerleading and she was the homecoming queen she was also a violin player but she was not only good at extracurricular activities she was also good at getting straight A's and good grades she was also a huge part of her local church Michelle was known to be this incredibly loving girl and caring all in one she she went on to win Miss Concord of 1976 due to how incredibly kind she was and beautiful, but more than that, she was the type that would make everybody around her smile and glow. When she met Martin, she was only 21 years old and he had just actually left the military and their love story escalated quickly. So quickly that they ended up eloping on February 21st of 1978 without telling anyone. 29, almost 30 years later, they had a beautiful family and this beautiful community where everybody loved them. They had Rachel, Vanessa, Alexis, and Damien biologically. And then they were also taking care of Vanessa's daughter, whom she had when she was a teenager named Ada. Now, Ada was still quite young, and so she was still living at home. However, the other biological kids at this point were all in college or they were out doing their own thing and were no longer living at the home. But the McNeils actually had adopted three more children from the Ukraine and they had met Gazelle, Elle, and Sabrina. And Michelle really wanted to adopt them because she loved being a mother. It was everything to her and she was said to be the best at it. She was incredibly empathetic and she really cared about her children's emotions and well-being and the little girls and, you know, the boy looked up to her so dearly. However, there were some of them who also felt the same way about their father, Martin, and he was really someone that they looked up to and they wanted to be daddy's little girls. Their childhood was said to be so fun 
fun and full of love and so many of the grown children would actually come back to visit the younger children and their parents even though they had a very busy schedule at college. They were known to be a tight-knit family that never had any sort of problems but these strange behaviors started around this time when Martin and Michelle were you know around 50 years old and they just had the younger children in their home and the normally confident and smiling former beauty queen suddenly decided she was in need of a full facelift. Michelle went to plastic surgeon Dr. Scott Thompson for a consultation telling him that she wanted this cosmetic procedure and at 50 years old it wasn't uncommon for women to want to do something like this. She had the money to do so and she you know wasn't in need of it but she wanted it and so they scheduled it for the next week so that their daughter Alexis one of the older daughters who was in medical school at that time could come back for her spring break and take care of Michelle. So the surgery occurred on April 3rd of 2007 and Michelle spent the night at the hospital with Alexis who was watching over her. She made it through the surgery without any complications. It had been completely successful. She was in pain. She was kind of looking bad because she was in recovery, but the next day she was actually healthy enough to be able to leave and go home, especially having Alexis who was in medical school, who knew how had to take care of her by her side. However, seven days later, Michelle would be dead. A 911 call came in from the McNeil residence April 11th at around 11.35 and Martin was screaming into the phone that his wife had drowned in the bathtub and he said he couldn't get her out of the tub on his own and then another 911 call came in and a neighbor had come to help her get out of the tub and he was giving her CPR but he needed an ambulance. When investigators finally arrived at the scene, Martin had told them that he had been at work that morning at an event and then he went up to pick up their youngest daughter Ada and so he then went home where Ada actually ran up to see Michelle only to find her mother deceased. By that point, it was too late. Michelle was already deceased and Martin told Ada to run next door to get some help and Alexis was then called by Martin after he had called 911 and told to come home immediately. But Alexis couldn't believe what she was hearing because she had just left the previous day to go back to college because her mom was doing so much better and didn't really need her. She had gone out to dinner. She had done, you know, a lot of just the household stuff. She was getting up out of bed she didn't appear as though she needed any more help and so she didn't know how she went from doing so well to so bad in such a short amount of time. Martin immediately was giving suggestions to the investigators saying maybe she took too much medication that she was on for the procedure and she slipped into the tub and she hit her head and he then said that he found her basically face down slumped over the tub that was already filled with water like she was about to get in and she had basically drowned head first. Alexis immediately returned back to Utah from her college in Nevada and she was getting the information of what had happened by this point the autopsy had come back stating that Michelle had died from a cardiovascular disease, basically that her death was accidental and due to the drowning or the, you know, medications, it had caused her to have a heart attack. But Alexis didn't believe this. You see, she had a gut feeling that her mother had been murdered. Now, Michelle had just had this operation done by Dr. Scott Thompson, but the truth was Michelle had always been one to stray away from cosmetic surgery. It's not that she had anything against it. It was just more that she didn't feel like she needed it or wanted it. She was happy with herself and her wrinkles. She she really didn't care about aging. She was more focused on her children and their well-being, and it wasn't until there was pressure on Michelle to actually have this procedure that she was persuaded into the surgery. Everything moved quite quickly when she began looking into it and even her daughter Alexis, who was by her side the entire time, thought things were going too fast. Now, like I told you, Alexis was in medical school, which is why she overlooked all of her mother's appointments and Alexis had actually followed in the footsteps of her father, Martin, who was a doctor and a lawyer, and she had heard all of her mother's fears about going into the surgery because she was having trouble with high blood pressure at the time and certain doctors had told her you know maybe we should wait until we get that under control before we do this. Michelle also wanted to lose some weight before the surgery just to have everything in tip-top shape before going under the knife. However before any of that could be kind of settled she was already having plans to 
have the surgery. Afterwards, she was prescribed some medication. She had the painkiller, Lortab, sleeping medication, Ambien, anti-anxiety, Valium, a stronger pain reliever, Percocet, anti-nausea, meds, Phenergen. These were so many medications which was strange because this was a woman who wouldn't even take the prescribed dosage of medication she was given at any point. She would always take only one at a time or the lowest dose possible because she didn't think she needed all of that. The truth was Dr. Scott Thompson was performing the surgery, but he wasn't really the one in charge. You see, Dr. McNeil was the one who set up the appointments and booked the anesthesiologist. He was also in the room with Michelle and Alexis during the consultations, and he was said to do more of the talking than anybody. He said that he wanted to have this done for Michelle as a present. And when the doctor said that he was worried about Michelle's blood pressure, Dr. McNeil said that he was disappointed by this and that she would be fine. During Michelle's recovery, Dr. Thompson was asked by Dr. McNeil for his wife's medication although he had asked for much more than the regular medications that would be given for a recovery. Now, Dr. Thompson respected Dr. McNeil, who was a very accomplished doctor, and so when he was asking for meds for his wife, he believed he knew what he was doing, and he ended up giving them to him, even though it was much more than the regular dosages, and he requested the meds in liquid and suppository form as well. The doctor did tell Michelle, you know, don't take more than one pill at a time, and not to take them together and so the doctor that Alexis had begun to suspect in the foul play wasn't the doctor who performed Michelle's surgery. It was her own father who was a doctor as well. You see Martin, who was the same age as his wife Michelle, had really never cared about what he looked like before either. However, during this time he started going to the gym regularly. He would stop mid-conversation to do push-ups, jumping jacks. He was going tanning all the time. He was working longer hours than normal. He was making sure that he looked in tip-top shape all the time and he was more worried about what he looked like than anything else, including his wife and his children. The children had noticed this and had noticed that Michelle noticed this and Michelle began getting worried that she was going to lose her husband or he was going to have an affair and that was why he was making himself look so nice. That's when Martin began to talk to Michelle about this possible facelift and he was very persistent which made Michelle feel even worse like maybe she did need it. He said that if she went ahead and got it he would take her on a two-week cruise, everything would be amazing, but on the way to the appointment Michelle was having doubts and she really didn't want to go through with it and Alexis who was in the car as well heard her father say that if Michelle didn't have the surgery now she wasn't gonna have it at all. Once Michelle finally agreed, she went through with the surgery, Martin had actually wanted to bring her home the night of the surgery, even though the other surgeons were saying that's not a good idea. And Alexis actually had to fight her father off from taking Michelle home so she could stay there. Then the next day, when they did return home, Martin told Alexis's daughter that she could go ahead and sleep in the other room and that he would take care of Michelle. However, the day after that, the morning after that, Alexis went straight to her mother's room to check on her and she was completely unresponsive. She was still breathing and Alexis immediately asked her father what had happened and his response was that he probably over-medicated her. When Michelle finally came back too, she asked Alexis to give her every single pill that she had, the different kinds, in her hands so she could feel them because she actually had patches over her eyes which made it so she couldn't see. So she wanted to feel these pills to make sure she knew what her husband was giving her. Michelle then told Alexis that she thought that her husband, Martin, was giving her pills she didn't need. And she said that at one point she even threw up from all the medication he was giving her and he still proceeded to give her more. She was completely sedated and out of it. And I went right to my dad and he said, oh, I think I gave her too much. And he said, oh, and your mother threw up. So then I gave her more medicine. I said, dad, don't give her any more medicine. I'm, I'm gonna take over. And at that time, she had a little eye patch on, so she couldn't see, you know, what he was giving her. And she said, Alexis, your dad, he just kept giving me medicines. And so she told me, she said, give me each of the pills so I can feel it with my fingers. So if he tries to give me something else, I'll know what he's giving me. And so I did that. I let her feel all the different types of medicines. 
After this, Alexis began keeping a log of the medication Michelle was getting as well as her food intake and her vital signs and she told her father she was taking over and he was not to give Michelle meds anymore. Now when they went back for a follow-up appointment, Michelle was doing much better. She was taking less medication. She didn't need it anymore. However, Martin then asked the doctor to prescribe more and refill the strong pain reliever Percocet and anti-nausea Finnergan. Only two days after the surgery, Michelle was doing much better, but she was still needing help in some areas. So Alexis was actually giving her bath, washing her hair, and suddenly Michelle turned to her very serious and said, if anything happens to me, make sure your dad didn't do it. Alexis had no idea what she was talking about and she, you know, wanted to believe that her dad would never do anything like this, that he was a great guy and so she kind of just dismissed her and didn't want to talk about it anymore. She started to cry. She said, if anything happens to me, make sure it wasn't your dad. And I said, mom, I kind of got upset. The morning of Michelle's death, Alexis was already back in Nevada at college when she called to talk to her mother that morning around 8.44 a.m. Michelle told her daughter she was doing well, she was going to pick up the kids after school, and Alexis kind of felt better about not being there because she was doing better. However, only 30 minutes later at 9.10 a.m., Martin called her and said that her mother was not doing well and wouldn't stay in bed, and so she needed to call her and tell her to stay in bed. She tried but only got her voicemail and two hours later, Michelle was dead. Now, Michelle's other children who were still living with her at the time had seen her that morning. She was sitting in front of the TV on the couch and she told them that she was doing great, that she would pick them up. But unfortunately, that would never occur again. When Alexis got that call from her father that her mother was dead, the first thought in her head was that her father had killed her mother. And a gut feeling she didn't know if she could prove or if it was even correct. He said, your mom, she's in the tub. She's not breathing. I've called an ambulance. And then he hung up. And I just started driving to the airport and I was just screaming, just screaming. He killed her. That was my first instinct. He killed her. But when she heard about the death being called accidental, she had an even deeper gut feeling and she was very confused. And investigators believe that it was probable for Michelle to have been in a fragile state due to medications and not being in full health. And they also believed it was possible for Martin to not be able to lift Michelle out of the tub on his own because he had been walking with the cane for the previous weeks. Now he had actually come out recently claiming that he had cancer in his foot and that he was also in the beginning stages of MS. So he was really going downhill with his health. Martin had even made an announcement as to his church saying he had less than a year to live. And so it really did seem probable that he was not strong enough to lift her out even if he wanted to. And he even had an alibi that he was at work that morning and he was picking up his daughter and neighbors and operators as well as investigators all said that Martin seemed truly distressed when he found his wife. However, the operator who talked to Martin did say that she noticed how angry he was getting with her. She kept having to call him back when he hung up on her about three different times. And the address he gave her at first wasn't correct, but she figured it out and she figured that that was just due to his panic. We have the police department address for medical. Okay, what's the problem, sir? Three medical. Sir, what's wrong? Who's in the bathtub? Who's in the bathtub? My wife. Okay, is she conscious? She's not. I'm a physician. Okay, sir. Sir, I need you to calm. Sir, I, I can't understand you. Okay, can you calm down just a little bit? Okay, what? Well, your wife is unconscious. She is unconscious. She's in the water. Okay, did you did you get her out of the water? I did. I just want to the water out. I'm still in the water. She's under the water. She is out of the water. Now the woman was in the ambulance. Okay, is she breathing at all? She is not. Okay, sir, the ambulance has been paged. They're on their way, okay? Do not hang up. What? Sir? Why would an 
don't see no be safe. Sir, this is 911. Can I help you? I need help. Okay, sir, they're on their way. Is your wife breathing? She is not. I am a physician. I got CPR in progress. You're Let doing me. CPR. You know? Oh, no, sir. no, sir. How old is your wife? My wife is 50 years old. She just had surgery here a couple of days. Oh, we know. What kind of surgery did she have? She had a facelift. She had a facelift? Yes. Okay, do you know how to do CPR? I'm doing it. Okay, do not take... It was really hard to understand him because he was yelling very hysterically at me. He seemed very irritated at me and bothered that I was even asking him these questions. Now, when Michelle was seen by the neighbors, they claimed that she was actually kind of face up in the tub with her head by the faucet and fully submerged in the water with clothes on. Yet Martin had said that she was face down in the tub instead. After they got her out of the tub though, Martin was said to do the CPR, but the neighbor didn't believe that he had actually ever seen Martin put his mouth on Michelle's lips. And then when the paramedics arrived, they did Michelle's CPR and she immediately started spitting up lots of water. This is something that should have occurred when Martin was doing the CPR as a doctor, but she still had so much water in her lungs. When the paramedics were there, Martin kept trying to talk to them about what happened and getting in their way, and no one was listening to them because they were trying to save his wife, and then he got angry and began yelling. Everyone was actually so scared of his anger that he was removed from the room, and they found his behavior strange, but at the same time, grief can cause strange behavior, and so they chalked it up to that. And that's when Martin and Michelle's son, Damien's, girlfriend and Damien came to the residence. Now, Damien and his girlfriend had come home that night and Martin had asked them to look in the bathroom where their mother had died. Martin said that there was blood everywhere when he found her and they saw a completely clean room with no blood. Looking further into his alibi, his daughters found, because the investigators were not looking into this because it was ruled as natural causes and closed, the daughters were doing the investigation. So the daughters had found that Martin had been at work that morning where he was having an event, well, the whole hospital was, and basically he was receiving an award. But before that award actually occurred and he got it, he went up to the event coordinator and asked them to make sure that he got his picture taken there. And then once the pictures were taken, he went up to the photographer and asked them to make sure that they got a picture of him. When it came to his illnesses, no one questioned a doctor about what he was feeling and what he was diagnosed with, but they had noticed that he was telling different neighbors and coworkers different symptoms, and he was also seen remodeling his basement and carrying giant slabs of concrete. He would also run without his cane and then suddenly be hobbling with his cane, and it was just quite strange. And so they began looking into medical records, and it was then found that he neither had cancer nor MS, and he was completely healthy. Michelle's daughters, Alexis and Rachel, two of the grown daughters, went to investigators asking for a review of the toxicology report. Alexis had tried to go in after she finally arrived back at the home to find her mother's pills to see how many that she had taken or had been forced to take, and she could not find the pill bottles anywhere. Her little book of medications, food intake, vital signs was also gone as well. The room was all cleaned out. There was no hospital belongings at all, and it appeared as though someone had cleaned out the room. The bathroom rug was even missing as well, and the trash was full of Michelle's belongings. Martin told Alexis that the police must have took all the medications she was looking for, but his daughter Rachel also arrived, and this time Martin told both of them that an autopsy needed to be done so that no one would think that he murdered Michelle. The autopsy that eventually did get done ruled her death as a heart attack. Martin had nothing to worry about, but the doctors who had done an exam of Michelle prior to her surgery to clear her did note that she had high blood pressure, but she also had an EKG that showed that her heart was normal and she had no evidence of heart disease or being even close to having a heart attack. That is when it was revealed that on top of their father's strange behavior, Michelle had also asked him about having a possible affair before her death. Martin claimed that he had no time for an affair. He was working, he was taking care of them, and he was just trying to make himself look better for himself. That's when he said that maybe Michelle needed a change 
and offered her a facelift. His wife's gut feeling about adultery was then turned into insecurity about herself with just a few words. But Martin appeared to be quite the manipulator and this was even after Michelle had told Alexis that she believed her father was cheating and Alexis went and got his phone records and that is when they found out there was a number he was calling all the time in the middle of the night. It was all one woman named Jillian Willis. Now, when they asked him about this, he said that he was basically just talking to her because she was a tenant at one of the homes that he rented out and that he simply needed to contact her about different things and she was up all the time because she was in medical school. Alexis, who was the apple of her father's eye and wanted to be just like him and that's why she went to medical school, was more than willing to believe anything he said because he had never done anything harmful to the entire family ever before. Until her mother's death, she had never talked to her mother's side of the family about his past. Because when she went to her mother's side of the family and started kind of telling them what had happened and what she was finding out and kind of making up excuses for Martin, they began to tell her that she was just like her mother, making excuses for Martin. You see, when Martin and Michelle eloped, it wasn't because there was too much excitement of love and they wanted to do it quickly. It was because they were avoiding Michelle's family who did not like Martin and did not want them to get married. Her family didn't like him from the very beginning, didn't approve of him. They believed he was very strange and controlling and unfortunately, Michelle was already in love and being gaslighted and manipulated. What put her family over the edge about Martin was actually that she caught him looking at sexually explicit material, which as Mormons, this was completely frowned upon. And when she said that she was going to leave him, he threatened to not only take his own life, but take hers as well. This happened again only two years prior to her death. And this time their son Damon actually had to wrestle Martin to the ground because he had a butcher knife and was going after Michelle. He then actually spent a night at the psychiatric hospital after the police were called. And while Utah investigators closed Michelle's death as not being a murder, saying it was completely natural, her sister, Linda, wrote a letter to the governor asking for them to investigate her death. Only three days after Michelle was found, Martin was insisting that they have the funeral. He also forbade Michelle's side of the family from coming to Michelle's funeral. Now, the children stood crying, saying the most beautiful things about their mother, and they also noticed a very strange woman in the audience they had never seen before. Martin then stood up in front of everyone and joked and was saying that life was unfair to him and was talking about himself. The community then began catching on to this odd behavior of this widowed doctor, and Martin possibly killing Michelle became a very popular theory all around. Little did many know how true that could really be, yet Martin was still walking free, treating patients and watching the young children that he had had with his wife. But after the funeral service, a young woman approached Martin, Alexis, and Rachel. She said that her name was Gypsy and that she was so sorry for the loss, that she was in nursing school, she would help them in any way that they needed, and then Martin got her phone number and she left. Martin shortly after began joking that he needed to get used to being a bachelor. A little over a week later, Martin began putting on interviews for a nanny. He still had four children who were in his care, who were still young, and as an only father, it seemed like the right thing to do. Except for the fact that his older daughters, Alexis and Rachel, offered to postpone school and watch the kids during this time of grief and do anything they could to help out. Martin claimed that he didn't need them, that he had interviews already set up, and before the children knew it, a woman was moving into their home. Gypsy was introduced to the children, and Alexis quickly realized that she was doing nothing. She was not cooking, cleaning, taking care of the children, and that's when she realized where she'd seen her from. This woman had been at the funeral and had talked to them. And that's when she found out Gypsy's full name was Gypsy Jillian Willis. The same woman that her mother had believed Martin was having an affair with. I think it's Jillian. I said, Dad, Gypsy Jillian Willis. I said, I know that woman. I know mom was worried you were having an affair with her and you were not to bring her in the home and he said there is going to be an interview for a nanny and there was only one candidate and that was Gypsy. Gypsy. Imagine that. Yeah. And she got the job. She didn't cook, she didn't clean, 
She didn't take care of the children in any way. When Alexis asked her father why she wasn't actually being the nanny like she was hired to be, Alexis and Rachel were kicked out of the house without shoes, without keys, without any of their belongings and told that they were not a part of the family anymore. She walked into the house like she owned the place. And then when I questioned my dad and said, what's going on? He said, oh, she's a guest in our home and how dare you question me? I was told that I needed to leave the home because I, I wasn't nice to Gypsy. So we you know. were basically, we were pushed out of the house Without by my dad. I didn't even have shoes on, no not even a phone. He wanted to make it known that it was either Gypsy or his children, and he chose the nanny. Yeah. The nanny. The problem was the younger children were still living in the home, and this is why Alexis and Rachel continued to talk to their father even though they believed that he could have been a murderer because they wanted to make sure that their siblings were safe. And so they eventually got back into the house and they were told they could do so as long as they were nice to Gypsy. Five weeks after Michelle's death on May 23rd, another horrific event would occur. Alexis would wake up with her father's hands down her pants and he was rubbing her butt as well as licking one of her hands and she freaked out and he said he was sorry that he thought that she was her mother and Alexis then threatened to go to the police unless he gave her custody of the children. Martin then said that she could try to fight him but he would ruin her. He would destroy her future career and get her kicked out of medical school but she said that she would do whatever it took to get her siblings and she wouldn't lie. Alexis went to the police saying that her father was a sexual predator and she was told that it was incredibly hard to prosecute for sexual assault, basically saying that there was nothing that they could do. And the same thing occurred when she went to Child Protective Services to try to get her younger siblings out of the house. She was told that he hadn't touched any of them so they could basically not take them away. Not only was this man now possibly getting away with murder, but also sexual assault and he still had custody of those little kids. But he wouldn't for long, and that wasn't because the older siblings would get them, unfortunately. You see, Alexis was then told by her own father that he was giving the children back up for adoption. He was going to give them to another family that they had known prior who were willing to take them in. This type of rehoming is not legal and would have had to been done under the radar. Now, the oldest of the four younger that were still in the home was 16-year-old Gazelle, and she actually wasn't going to be adopted out. He had another plan for her. Martin was actually sending Gazelle to see her sister, her biological sister, back in the Ukraine for that summer. There was a whole nother plan brewing because Gypsy, the mistress, was in a lot of debt. She was about $50,000 in debt and Martin had the perfect idea of how to get her out of trouble. He got their adopted daughter, Gazelle's social security number and birth certificate and gave it to Gypsy, giving her this new identity. Martin then began telling people that Gypsy was his daughter to some, his wife to the others, but he even put the house that they lived in under her name when it had once belonged to Michelle. Meanwhile, Gazelle was stuck in the Ukraine and she was with her sister who was trying to do her best but didn't have much and there was one bed for the entire family there and they had to shower in the floor, like in a pan in the floor. She couldn't get back in the States because her father had taken her passport and all of the information and given it to another woman. This continued for a year. And then in 2009, Martin's karma finally caught up with him because his daughter Gazelle over in the Ukraine had finally gotten all the paperwork she needed to go back to the States without needing him. Here's Gazelle, <laughs> her last day in Ukraine. <laughs> Thank goodness she's excited. It was quickly found that in the United States, there were two people with the same social security number. And from there, it wasn't hard to figure out what was actually happening. Martin and Gypsy were finally arrested, but this wasn't for murder. This was for identity theft. They both pled guilty and Martin was sentenced to only three years in prison while Gypsy was given three years probation. Yet, this gave the daughters a chance to possibly find something to connect him to the murder of their mother. Finally, in 2010, investigators Doug Whitley and Jeff Robinson were assigned this case. They actually were no longer working at this time and they came back to work on this case. And they got Utah's chief medical examiner, Dr. Todd Gray, to review the toxicology report once again. And he found that none of the medications were at toxic levels, but the combinations of everything 
could have led to her having a cardiac death. After this, her cause of death was finally changed from natural causes to undetermined. That was because they believed it was the combined effects of heart disease and drug toxicity that caused her death. And this was a huge win for the children. They finally had something more concrete to fight with. And the state of Utah then went to interview Ada, the youngest daughter who actually found Michelle once again. She said that she saw her mother in her clothes, fully submerged in the bathtub. And that was before she began screaming and was told to go get the neighbors. After that, she was told to go play with the neighbor's children for the rest of the day. And due to Ada being quite young and traumatized, the state actually asked her older sister and then guardian Alexa Alexis to ask for basically more information about that day. And so Alexis asked her the position that Michelle was in, the amount of water in the tub, and her answers confirmed that Michelle was not just head first over the tub, as Martin has said. As investigators began looking into this case once again, they realized that they possibly may have another suspect to look into other than Martin. This was his son, Damien. He was a 24 year old who was in New York law school at this time, and he was there the night of the death. Investigators were wary of him because he had allegedly had very dark thoughts throughout his life. In fact, they sent a letter to his college saying that investigators deemed him very dangerous, possessing homicidal impulses and discussing the joys of killing. They had heard this over his own Twitter. However, he was not believed to be a part of his mother's death. Instead, the state charged Martin with the murder of his wife only two months after he was released for the identity charges. Martin said that he didn't want his daughter, Ada, to testify the trial, saying that Alexis was the one to talk to her, get the timeline, get all the information. And so basically she had used improper interview techniques that led to false memories. The court decided that Ada was not competent to testify, but her interview could be shown in the trial and she could be used for cross-examination. This is when another witness would come forward. This was the cellmate of Martin since he had been in jail. And in fact, there were five inmates willing to testify against Martin. They had confessed that Martin had confessed to them that he murdered his wife, Michelle. Once again, Martin tried to exclude this testimony. However, the court denied that and said that the jury would be able to know that there was a lack of credibility and a motive with these inmates. The informants would also need to disclose all benefits that they would be receiving in order to testify. In November of 2013, the trial began and camera coverage was actually banned, but it was live streamed instead for the first time in Utah. All witnesses were not allowed to hear any other witnesses testify until it was their turn and a cardiologist claimed that Michelle's heart was not severe enough to be at risk for a cardiac death. They believed that she had drowned to death due to her spitting up so much water and having lungs filled with that water. One inmate testified claiming that he had seen Martin on TV and then he went and talked to him while he was in jail and basically Martin said he gave his wife some oxy and sleeping pills and then got her into the bathtub and held her head under water. When the inmate asked why, Martin said that she was in the way and she wanted the house and the kids basically in the divorce. However, he still believed that the police couldn't prove it at that point. Another inmate testified saying that Martin was wearing different shoes and all the inmates were wearing and so he asked how he could get away with that and Martin basically told him he could get away with a lot of things like he was getting away with murdering his own wife. When the inmate kind of offered condolences about his wife's death, Martin said that he was glad the bee was dead. It was then uncovered just how the mistress and Martin had met. They had actually met in 2005, two years prior to the murder online. And they started talking constantly behind Michelle's back. They bonded over quantum physics and they believed they were the perfect match. At first they were just friends and she kind of moved into a home that he was renting out, that he owned. And he gave her a credit card so that she could pay for nursing school. And they began to talk about a future together. This was after Martin had already told her that he had the perfect wife, the perfect life. Now it seemed as though he thought it was too bad that he already had a family back home. Martin had killed his wife and then made his six-year-old daughter go up and find her deceased mother. She screamed while Martin stayed in the kitchen providing another alibi and staying away from the crime scene. It turned out that there were theories that Michelle's son Damon could have been involved as well because the night of the murder when Damon and his girlfriend arrived at the house, they found the pill bottles and they allegedly only had a few pills in them and then Martin and Damon began counting them together. But Martin said that Michelle was not taking her pills, he didn't want to count them anymore and then he asked them to flush the pills down the toilet. It's not known how much they really had as far as the involvement, the murder, 
or the disposal of evidence. The day that a husband should be grieving the death of his wife, he was texting his mistress over 30 times and had called her twice. At the funeral, Gypsy showed up without an invitation because she didn't want Martin to forget about her. She said that she was sorry that she was involved with him prior to her death and she was embarrassed. He then asked her to come help and support him and the day after Michelle's death, Gypsy sent him sexually explicit photos. They then staged it to make it appear as though he had found the perfect nanny so she could move in. Why did you move into the home? Martin told me that he needed help with his younger children. Were you still sleeping with him? I was. So were you the nanny or were you the girlfriend? I moved in to help with the kids. I, when we, when we had opportunity, I still slept with him. So you were both? You want to look at it like that. What nobody really knew was that they continued sleeping together every chance they got. They also went to Wyoming together that July without the kids, not even a year after Michelle's death, only three months later, for Martin to meet her parents. This is where he proposed, telling her parents that he never loved his ex-wife the way that he loved Gypsy and that he and Michelle were more like friends. He said, I never loved Michelle, but I love Gypsy. This was the man who'd been telling you just a couple months earlier that he had the perfect life and the perfect wife. Yeah. So you must have been shocked when three months after she died, he proposed marriage to you. I wasn't shocked. I, I, it just, like I said, it seemed very natural. It seemed like a natural progression. He gave this grand speech about how he loved her from the moment he saw her, and he knelt and proposed to her, and Gypsy cried. It was very fairy tale in a bad way they were perfect for each other. Then the couple applied for an identification card saying that they had married on April 14th of 2007, the same day of Michelle's funeral. Gypsy claims that when they stole Martin's daughter's identity for her, she didn't want to, but Martin told her it was temporary and wouldn't hurt anyone. Yet his own daughter was stuck back in the Ukraine without her family, and the entire family had just had their mother ripped away from them. By him. While in court, Martin was joking, talking to his attorneys, and even when his daughters were emotionally crying on the stand. After 11 hours of deliberation, Martin was found guilty and sentenced to 15 years to life. I will never getting recommendations for shorter sentences and that their testimonies were the sole reason that he was found guilty and so he believed he deserved a retrial. The prosecution claimed that the jury's decision was not due to a single witness but the mountain of evidence against him and in fact Alexis said when speaking with those jurors they actually said to me and my family that they didn't even weigh the testimony of the prisoners at all because they were prisoners but based on all of the other mountains of evidence found my father guilty. Yet Martin's other family members said that he was denied a fair trial. Martin then claimed that the state didn't include the information about the possible alternative suspect, and he began to point fingers at his son, saying that he was never fully looked into. However, the investigators did look into him and found that Damon was not a suspect in his mother's death. Yet Martin believed that this should have been stated in court. And this was after Damon had actually taken his own life when the whole investigation into him was happening. Some said that that pointed to guilt, but his sister said he was just haunted by his mother's death. Alexis believes that Gypsy was actually an accomplice to the murder and that if anything, she was the motive. However, she's never been charged with murder. Gypsy said to the family, I don't believe Martin murdered Michelle. We have to respect the jury, but I don't. I would say to Michelle McNeil's family, I'm so sorry for any part I played in anyone's pain. Yet it later came out that Gypsy's roommates had heard her say that she wanted Michelle gone and she had a picture of Michelle in her room, but not just a picture, a shrine. She was also said to be a witch casting spells against Michelle. She had also allegedly said that she wanted to cut Michelle's car brakes. Gypsy said this wasn't possible, that those roommates weren't living with her at the time, and that they only wanted attention. Martin then attempted to take his life in December of 2013 in jail, but he did survive. Then in 2014, Martin was finally taken to trial for the sexual abuse of his daughter, Alexis. Now she testified saying that she was not 
his only victim, but didn't want to talk any further. She also refused the plea deal, saying that it would send the wrong message if this didn't go to trial. She said that regardless of the outcome, she would feel better knowing that she had done everything in her power to protect her family, her sisters, and others from her father. The defense claimed that Alexis only said this to get custody of her sisters, and the prosecution claimed that yes, she did have motive, but that didn't mean it wasn't true. That she came forward to protect those other kids, and after two and a half hours of deliberation, he was found guilty and sentenced to another 15 years. He tried to appeal, but this was denied, and it turned out that as insane as his crimes were, his past was even more disturbing. Buckle up, because this is crazy. His children had quickly realized that their father was basically a fictional character and that it was an act the whole time with him. We basically found out that our entire lives had been based and surrounded on lies that everything about our experience with our father was a lie. You've played a part in destroying our whole family, Dad. I am the victim. I am the victim. You can't even think that that is a possibility. That oh. I'm the victim here. Man, if I think really hard, I can't even think of that. My logic is I didn't commit adultery. I didn't kill your mother. I didn't have a mistress. I don't have one now. I'm planning on getting married in the temple. And I don't believe that that is a, a bad thing to do. There's that possibility, whether you want to accept it or not. I've done nothing wrong. I have done zero wrong. Martin had been born on February 1st, 1956, and his brother had died when he was little. He joined the military at 17, but only two years later, he was discharged for schizophrenia and hearing voices. His criminal record began there with fraudulent checks where he had bought a house and jewelry, and he ended up being caught for this and went to jail for 180 days. Martin was still receiving veteran benefits for being mentally ill, that were around $3,000 a month for the decades after. He was still receiving them when he murdered Michelle, even though he was more than capable of work and was a successful doctor. Yet even his years as a doctor were a lie. You see, upon closer examination, it was found that the college transcripts that got him into medical school were forged. He had taken somebody else's and was never a real doctor. He had also had two affairs while married to Michelle that we know of. One was a woman named Anna Walthall, who said that Martin once told her that he knew how to induce a heart attack and make it look natural. The most crazy part is that Martin had also confessed that his brother Rufus Roy's death wasn't accidental, that he had drowned him in the bathtub all those years prior, just like Michelle. This was because he was embarrassed by his brother because he kept trying to take his own life, so he killed him instead. Martin had been having homicidal thoughts since he was a kid and had tried to kill his mother as well, but his sister thankfully came home and ended up saving her life. Only that one sibling remains out of all of them and nobody really knows how many he could have hand and killing. Martin was never investigated or punished for what he did to his family, and he had also admitted to killing several patients while working as a doctor. Patients also began coming forward saying that Martin sexually assaulted them as well. Martin would have been eligible for parole in 2031, but 10 years after the murder of his wife and two and a half years into his sentence, Martin was found dead at the Utah State Prison on April 9th, 2017. It appeared as though this was a suicide by using a hose and a natural gas line, and his children actually decided to forgive him at his funeral and let go of the pain and the hatred towards him for themselves. Alexis has since changed her last name to Summers, which is Michelle's maiden name, and she practices medicine under her last name instead. She adopted her sisters, who were Ada, Sabrina, and Elle, saying that they're just wonderful, wonderful girls. That's something that I was personally so blessed with. I don't know what I would have done without having my sisters to fight for. Alexis still lives in Utah and has three children and a husband herself. And the youngest sister she adopted, Ada, has since graduated from high school. Rachel is a social worker and Sabrina and Elle now have their own children. Every year they get together to celebrate Michelle's birthday with chocolate cake, which was her favorite. Do you believe that Gypsy had more to do with his murder? Do you think Martin really had more victims and murdered his brother? How many patients do you believe he killed that went unnoticed? Was Damon involved in any of this or was he just given the evil genetics of his father, which caused him to have these horrific thoughts, but he ended up killing himself before he did something horrible as well? 
Or did he already do something horrible? And that's why he couldn't live with it. I actually watched the Lifetime movie about this the other day and was baffled, but I thought it was all fictionalized. Come to find out, I do research and every single thing in that movie was true. And then there were even more horrific things that I found that I put in this video that the movie didn't cover. It just is an unraveling of horror after horror. And I truly hope that I did a, a good job of honoring Michelle's life because she truly seemed like a beautiful person inside and out that anybody would have been blessed to have as their mother. And I'm, I'm so sorry that her children don't get to have their, their mom watch their own children grow up. But I love that they honor her and they, they fought really hard to get her justice and they should be proud of that. So don't ever forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay, bye.